Hey guys and welcome back. I've got heaps of progress to cover in this episode so let's jump straight into it. Immediately after completing the previous video I got stuck into machining the remainder of the case parts. I started off with the side grip sections. These are a double sided job so I decided to do the inside first so that I could later use the tape and glue method on the large flat area to hold the part down on a jig when I needed to flip it over. I made both side grips at once since they are a mirror image of each other and it made it easier to hold the parts on the machine. I first used a 4mm end mill to rough out all of the material from the inside of the grips. I used a 2mm end mill to machine the rebates for the threaded inserts and the through holes for mounting the case. I then moved on to smoothing the internal surface out with a 4mm ball nose cutter. Once these processes were complete, I cut around the outside of the stock with a 4mm end mill so that I had the final outside shape of the part to work with when I flipped the parts over. In order to mount the grips on the bed of my CNC machine, I made this jig out of a bit of scrap aluminium. I applied painter's tape to the large flat surface of the jig along with the matching inside surface of the part and then stuck them together using super glue. This method ensured a nice tight hold on the thin section of the parts and allows me to begin the machining without having any clamps or screws holding down the stock to the jig. After aligning the stock to the machine with my dial indicator, the first step on this side was to machine out the rebates for the M3 screws that hold the grips onto the housing. I have drilled and tapped holes in the jig plate, so now that I have machined the rebates, I can also put screws in to ensure everything is held securely. I then proceeded to rough down all of the stock with a 4mm end mill and finished off with the 4mm ball nose to smooth out the surface. The process for the rear cover section was similar to that of the grips. I began by machining out the inside of the part with the same tools I used on the grips. I then fitted the threaded brass inserts so I could use them to hold down the part on the jig when I flipped it over. I made a jig to help support the middle section of the cover since it is quite thin, so I knew machining it was going to be difficult. I used the same tape and glue method between the inside of the rear cover and the jig and then screwed some M3 screws into the threaded brass inserts to hold down the outside edges of the part. I should have used the tape and glue method on the edges as the vibrations from the machining caused the screws to unwind slightly and the edges of the cover to lift up, causing some inaccuracy in the finished part. I did manage to jam some tape and glue under the corners but by that stage it was only to try and get the part off the machine in one piece as the damage was already done. The finished part looks fine and will work well enough for now but the tolerances aren't up to my usual standards so I will remake the part off camera when I have some time. Now that the housing is mostly complete I can really focus on getting the electronics sorted. First let's talk about the touchscreen. The front panel that I have chosen is from a 7 inch children's tablet. I chose it because it has even sized bezels and no camera hole, so it doesn't look like a tablet has just been stuck into a game console. The downside however is that it doesn't have an integrated controller, so I'll have to design my own for it. I ended up settling on an IC called a GT911, which seems to be a popular choice for capacitive touch displays of this size. I've bought a cheap touchscreen USB adapter which is supposed to work with the GT911 chip that I'm hoping to use to make the final connection to the computer. I'm no electrical engineer so I've just copied the example circuit from the datasheet and I'm yet to be able to get it to do anything at all. Everything I've been able to probe with my multimeter appears to be fine and I haven't got a scope so there isn't a lot more I can do to troubleshoot currently. The documentation on how you're supposed to connect this to a touch panel is a bit vague so I'm going to order another touchscreen with the GT911 already integrated so that hopefully I can both test the USB adapter to ensure it isn't the problem and work out what I've done wrong with my design. I have made some progress on a prototype design for the power management though. I've used a HUSB 238IC to provide the charge circuit with 20 volts from the USB-C port. The charger will consist of a BQ25792 charge controller, an INA219 current monitor and an Atmega 328P running some custom code to handle cell balancing and monitoring autonomously. Shout out to Coffee Scroll from the Discord for the suggestion of using the Atmega as I was stuck trying to pick a BMS IC for a while, but they were all either too complex for me to understand or required a specialty programming tool to make them work. The Pico will communicate with the current monitor and the Atmega over I2C 
to read voltage and current information about the battery pack to provide an accurate capacity and runtime estimate on the info display. Once I complete the initial design, I'll have to order some PCBs and do some thorough testing before I fully integrate it into the console. Since the last video, I've made some good progress on the controller side of things. I now have a fully functional controller prototype. I designed the left side of the controller to communicate with the right side over I2C to minimize the number of connections needed between the two sides. I used another Atmega 328P on the right controller PCB as a sort of IO expander since they are cheap and readily available and can even be scavenged from many Arduino boards. I also had to add a few more connections between the Pico PCB and right front PCB, meaning I ended up needing to order a complete new set of boards and parts for this next prototype. Luckily, PCBWay reached out to sponsor the rest of this project, so I got them to provide a complete set of controller PCBs for me in black. Once I have a final revision of the PCBs completed, I will set the project up with PCBWay so they can easily be ordered without needing to worry about uploading any files or any of the settings. Project files will still be available too, in case you wish to make changes. PCBWay also does CNC machining and many different types of 3D printing, so if you need any other parts for this or any other project completed, make sure you check them in. Once the PCBs turned up, I got stuck into populating them and testing. I've still found a few little issues that have slipped into this revision, so there will be at least one more revision of the controller PCBs, but nothing that has stopped me from getting the full controller working at least well enough to do some testing. I still have a bunch of code to write for the menu system and the calibration process, but I've done a manual calibration on the joysticks for now and I have all the buttons working except for the analog triggers which I haven't made yet. For now, I've just 3D printed some buttons to be able to test the controller, but my final build will have resin cast buttons that I'll work on in the next episode. I also have designed some silicon covers for the D-pad and ABXY buttons. This is similar to what Nintendo have done with their Joy-Cons, just for a much larger and easier to solder switch. It softens the tactile feel of the switch, reduces the sound of the click, and increases the travel just enough to make them feel satisfying to press without having the extra long travel of a regular membrane button. I have used these on my Game Boy CM3 and the Retrolight project in the past, and in my opinion, they greatly improve the feel of the buttons. I will upload a taller version of the buttons too, in case you're a masochist that enjoys the sound of hard tactile clicks while you button mash away at your favourite game. So now, let's give it all a quick test with a couple of games. First up, I've chosen Colin McRae Dirt 3. This was a very visually impressive game back in 2011 when it was released, and I have spent quite a bit of time in this game with a wheel and pedals, so it'll be interesting to see what it's like on a gamepad. This game is a good example of why the controller needs to be able to switch to a keyboard and mouse mode, as it has no support for joysticks in the menu system. I'm just using a keyboard off screen to navigate the menus for this video. Running at native screen resolution on the default settings, according to Steam's built-in FPS counter, the NUC is managing a consistent minimum of about 70 FPS when other cars are on screen. That jumps up to around 120 FPS when no other cars are on screen. The joystick feel is nice and linear, and I haven't had to set much of a dead zone so it feels pretty responsive too. This game will definitely benefit from the triggers once I get them set up. Next up, here's a bit of Portal 2. This one is another favourite of mine that I've played through many times over the years. With the settings cranked all the way up and running at the native screen resolution, it's managing about 100 FPS. I'm not very good at FPS style games on a gamepad, so if the gameplay looks a little awkward, it's definitely just my ability level rather than the controls. This one was a bit of a pain to get running because it relies on Steam's built-in controller support for button configuration. For some reason, Steam's controller setup didn't like the joysticks, so I had to go in and edit the config manually to get it working. I will provide the modified config file or at least instructions on how to do it to hopefully make the process easier for others. Next up, let's test it on some emulation. I'll start with the Wii version of Mario Kart. The inbuilt controller configuration in Dolphin worked much better than Steam's one did for this controller, so setup was a breeze. The only video option I've changed is to use DirectX 12 instead of OpenGL, which helps with the performance a fair bit. This one does slow down slightly at the beginning of a race, but once you're in a race it seems to run great. 
And to round us out, here's a bit of Ratchet and Clank on PS2. This was my absolute favourite game series in my early teens, so it's going to be great being able to come back and replay a few of the titles from this series. This is the second game in the series, as the first game actually runs quite poorly under emulation, even on a powerful gaming computer. I'm running it at two times native resolution, with forced widescreen enabled, and all other settings are on defaults. According to the inbuilt stats in PCSX2, it's running at 100% speed all of the time, and we are only putting about 50% load on the CPU. I'll do some more serious testing of games in the upcoming videos, so drop me a comment if there's something you want to see me test. I'm sure a few of you are eagerly awaiting the files for this project, so I thought I should give you a bit of an update on that. I've only got to finish test fitting the trigger buttons, and then I'll be pretty confident about how everything goes together, and I can start releasing at least the 3D files for anyone that wants to get an early start on the project. I'm pretty close with the controller PCBs too, so once I have the next revision in my hands and tested, I should be able to release them. The power management side of things is going to take a little longer whilst I test and write the software to ensure it's safe. I want to thoroughly test mine before I allow anyone to build their own, as obviously a lithium charger circuit is a major safety hazard if done incorrectly. I will keep you guys updated as I progress though. The Discord is starting to get busier, so make sure you jump on over and join up if you're thinking about building one of these once I release the files. We have a bunch of like-minded people over there already, and support for the project will be done primarily through the Discord too, so it's definitely the place to be if you enjoy this type of project. One last thing, massive thanks for all the subscribers so far. We've just hit a thousand subs after just a few months of making videos. If you haven't yet subscribed but you're enjoying the project, please hit that subscribe button and drop me a like or a comment to help support the project. Thank you and see you next time.